Greetings today from Botswana. I have rather another serious subject, as I seem to be getting known for that serious subject to bring before you. But as a, as a Christian, uh, I would to bring everything before the Lord in light of his word. I would go by John 3.21, He that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. Where I would say from Psalm 139, O Lord, you know, search me, try my ways, see if they are pleasing to you, lead me in the way everlasting. And so we are indeed supposed to examine ourselves to be in faith. And when I come across something in the word, I look at it and say, hey, I'm supposed to be, I'm supposed to be like this. And I know that I'm not. Then these are things that have to change. Of course, we are not able in ourselves to change them. As believers, the Holy Spirit must change them within us. Uh, but also, according to 2 Corinthians 13, 5, we are to examine ourselves whether we be in faith. And so some of these may be a greater challenge than others, not just minor changes, but there could be a heart change that really needs to take place. And so the topic today is about confronting death. How do we look at death as Christians? Unfortunately, what I've been seeing only too much is I've been seeing in these last days that professing believers are really not ready or willing to die. They keep holding on to their lives here. I definitely have seen that there are a couple reasons for this. One is just a fear, a fear of death. And the other one is that they just love their lives in the world too much. They don't want to leave it. We have been told that it is appointed to man once to die, but after this, the judgment. And so this is something that we all have to face, and we should face it as believers. And yet it seems to me that many of these obviously still have, still have their feet in the world, and they are not ready to leave. Brethren, we need to get ready to leave. So let me share a few scriptures with you here. Uh, these first scriptures that I'm going to share are... I put, put them down as positive death scriptures, the way we should be looking at things, things that put a, a more positive spin on the outcome. It is true, death is never pleasant, and we should weep with those who, the, who weep, even as Jesus showed us in the death of his friend Lazarus before he raised him from the dead. But indeed, these scriptures put a slightly more positive spin on it. And I invite you again to look in the description below for other scriptures. Things that I have listed, I will only do a few, uh, a few at a time, uh, for time's sake, here in this video. From Isaiah 57, verses 1 and 2, The righteous perisheth, and no man layeth it to heart. And merciful men are taken away, none considering that the righteous are taken away from the evil to come. He shall enter into peace, they shall rest upon their beds each one walking in his uprightness. So we see that we're being taken away from the evil that is to come. You may think of King Josiah from Judah. God had shown him that he would not be around to see the evil he was bringing on Judah. And indeed, he was taken away rather abruptly. But again, he was taken away from the evil that is to come. It is a time to rest, and it is a good thing. Another scripture I want to look at, I'm going to John chapter 11, verses 25 and 26. Remember, I will have these listed at the bottom of the page if I'm going too fast. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? Jesus was talking to Martha, you know, when he said this. But this is very encouraging. We need to understand that we will never die. This is a part of God's promise to us. He has promised us everlasting life. And from what I've seen, from what I know, when the body ceases to function, the spirit is very much alive. And if you were in pain prior to your death, that pain will cease. You will not have that pain anymore. That's a great thing. And so it's an encouragement with these verses here. Again, remember that Jesus is the resurrection. He that believes in him shall never die. From here, I'd like to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I'm going to read the first eight verses, I believe. 
For we know if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. If so, being found clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up in life. Now he that hath wrought us the selfsame thing is God, who also hath given us the earnest of the Spirit. Therefore we are always confident, knowing that, whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. This is exactly where we should be. Exactly where we should be with the Lord. Sorry, got an urgent message there I had to pay attention to. And so this is an encouragement for us. Where are our affections at? And all too often I see this, just a love of the world something that we should not to have. Going into this, I will read some scriptures. These are scriptures that just tell us we should be divorced from this world. Our affections should be with the Lord in heaven. We should, we should love Jesus. We should want to see him. And I dare say many people that profess the Lord simply aren't ready for this. I can't judge a person where they are, you know, with, with Christ as far as salvation goes. But if you can see something scripturally and say, wow, I'm not here, then you say, Lord, help me. Help me to bring my life into submission the way you want it to be. So here we have Matthew 16, verses 24 and 25. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever shall save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. So here again, we are saying we should not love our lives in this world. We should be putting them aside. Where are our affections at? This is something that ought to come with the changes that are made in salvation, but it does come in growth over years also. And as long as we will be in the flesh, we will never be perfect. I would also then read from John 12, 25. Jesus is speaking here. He said, He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. More or less the same thing that's being said in Matthew, uh, a slightly different way. If we love our lives in this world, we will not keep them. And then finally, of course, I will go to James. I say of course because I've used it many times before. James chapter 4, verse 4. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. So again, the Lord is encouraging us to separate from the world and from worldly affections. And this is why we need that daily crucifying of the flesh. And uh, thankfully, it is not a literal crucifying. We could only do that once. And uh, I thank, thank the Lord that he has done that for us. Another thing I want you to consider is that here at the end of time, there are a lot of prophecies concerning death. There is a lot of death that is going to come upon the world. I don't want to dwell on that. I don't want to give people a, a bad time in that way. But the point is, even today, I'm, as I'm seeing some of my news sources, we are just edging closer to World War III every moment. And, you know, that's nothing to look forward to. But if we as believers see where this world is going to, we ought to be getting ready for it and helping other people, see, people to get ready for it. As I read now from Matthew 24, 9 and 10, Then shall they deliver you up, that is the disciples, then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Many shall be offended, shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. <clears throat> so you can see Jesus himself said this directly. And of course, we see a lot from the book of Revelation. We see in Revelation 9.15, the four angels were loosed, which were 
that were in the river Euphrates, they were prepared for an hour, a day, and a month, and a year for to slay the third part of men. One third of men will die in this one hour war. And also we see in 1211, And they overcame him, the him there is the devil, and they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. You know, when everything is going well, it's easy for us to say we will love our Lord to the death, but many of us are simply not ready for that. And I would urge you to get ready for that. I just give a couple of examples so that you can know what I'm thinking of. If I've said these before, please excuse me. Uh, I have limited examples, and I really don't like to dwell on a lot of negative. Uh, one would be a friend that I have who is just departing from this area, going back home. And again, he said to me at one point how he really wanted to see America before he dies. Just this implication says he loves his, his life in this world too much. Now, I'm not saying that he didn't misspeak or something like that. But he said, I want to see America before I die, which tends to imply that if he gets, if he dies and he doesn't see America, then he has lost something. I'm not sure how any, any Christian could say such a thing. Surely what the Lord has for us is way beyond anything that we could find here in this world. Then another, another example I would give, there's one at our church who often starts giving a brief testimony. And one of the things she, she says very often, uh, nearly all the time, but very often, she just says, I thank God that I am alive today. Like this. Now, she is unmarried. She has no children. As far as I can tell, there is no one that is dependent on her. And she is thanking God that she is alive today. And it, it's, it's not that we shouldn't be thankful for things. But it's like saying one more day on earth, because I don't want to go home to be with Jesus. Remember what we read in 2 Corinthians 5, that we groan in our tabernacle, wanting to be absent from the body and present with the Lord. And so when I hear somebody say, I'm thankful to be alive today, and I never hear, I'm thankful that the Lord saved my soul from hell, I never hear that. I just hear, I'm glad to be alive today. And that's a pretty... A uh, pretty thin thing. Hopefully, I'll be able to say something to her a little bit more directly as the Lord gives opportunity. Because I'm not saying that she isn't necessarily a believer, but there's something that is seriously in this. Or we may see it also in people that are suffering from cancer. Sometimes they're suffering from camps, cancer. It's a bad outlook. Uh, it's more or less known that they're not going to recover, but they might have a little while longer. And so they take all kinds of excruciating treatments. They rack up incredible medical bills. They keep their loved ones on the edge of their seat figuratively. Oh, are they going to live? Are they going to die? You know, I don't know. And so uh, my mother passed away from cancer. And I remember that she had come to me when, when I was at work one day. and She was able to come and talk to me. At that point, they were going to remove a tumor from her. And then they were going to see where that, where that, uh, where they were at, if they needed to do more treatments. But after they had removed the tumor, they thought that the cancer was okay. They had gotten it and nothing further would happen, which of course, you know, almost a year later, she had died from the cancer. They couldn't find it. I'm not blaming them. That's not the point. She spoke to me and just said, you know, like, what if? they had found something, if, if they knew it, and they would have had to do chemotherapy. And she said she really didn't know that she would take it because she was ready to go and be with the Lord. That's what she said. Isn't that how we should look at it as Christians? Shouldn't we trust our healing to the God who, who, who gives us that benefit? He heals all our diseases. Give him that opportunity to do it. Is he more glorified by our death or by our life? So we should always be seeking to put the Lord first. I hope this has been helpful to you. I don't mean to pick on you. Just bring it before the Lord. Examine your hearts before him. And uh, the Holy Spirit will strengthen you to walk in the way he guides you. May God bless.